we have, uh, uh, <laughs> now we're on a roll. Um, as a speaker from the Aid Services Foundation uh, of Orange County, I'm going to uh, just say a few words before I uh, introduce her formally to the class. And as usual, we go over um, some of the items that we covered in the previous week. So I'm going to ask you this one question, knowing that you're all very shy and you wouldn't raise your hands to say you have questions from last time. But uh, half of this class is focused on writing. And uh, we talked last week about how to overcome writer's block. Can somebody say something about our strategies? Yes. Leave your ego at the door. Don't, don't uh, try to get it perfect the first time. Any other strategy? Yeah. Writing an outline, extremely crucial. Um, anything else? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, read it out loud. Because sometimes that just uh, unravels some of the um, and naughty issues that you're dealing with. And uh, the other is to not get so angry uh, when you're writing a response to somebody's comments. So avoid using words that get you stuck. Um, and uh, when you think more rationally about the issue, you're able to express your feelings. It's kind of like a kid holding their breath because they're angry and they turn blue. But if you breathe and let it out, you are able to express yourself uh, more clearly. OK, so um, some of you have asked about uh, Tonitin. Um, because it's a writing class, we are required to teach you about the ethics also of writing. And in the syllabus, we detailed uh, some of the no-nos about uh, academic misconduct in terms of writing. So uh, using quotations appropriately, avoiding uh, cut and paste, obviously. Uh, plagiarism is a very serious issue that we want to make sure you recognize it, you resist the temptation to do it. And if you are ever in a situation where you find it in somebody else's writing that you point it out, because that's part of <coughs> the training to uh, good writing. So Tonitin is an online program that the campus is subscribed to. And um, all of your writings will be submitted to Tonitin. And uh, you can have access to submit your articles by type going to the website, tonitin.com. Type in, in the class ID 63951244 and the password 89550. The password is essentially the course code uh, for Public Health 195W uh, this, this quarter. So um, <clears throat> the TA already has this and the readers also, and it will be a very easy thing to check. Sometimes you, you can do this yourself. If you're worried you have a long document to write, maybe late at night you might have you know, hope to cite somebody or quote them adequately. Before you submit, it's a very good idea to double check yourself so that we don't have to have a problem with this. Any, other, any questions about this particular issue? OK. Um, <clears throat> There, there are several strategies that I'd like to spend maybe just five minutes talking to you about in terms of your next assignment, which is the scholarly review. Um, you already wrote an outline, and we're looking at that, or already uh, evaluated many of them. Um, and in doing the outline, we gave you particular framework to select uh, journal articles from different uh, disciplines of public health, and then uh, place the topic within the practicum site uh, mission that you are uh, working on. So it's important to know uh, that uh, even if you're working at the same site with two or three other students, 
the kinds of ideas that will be appealing to you within that context will be different based on your experience, your background, and your particular role at that uh, public health agency. So um, it's OK to talk to the other students working at the, the same practicum site to compare notes. But um, it's certainly more important to make sure that your work is as original as you can make it. Uh, reviewing and revising draft, I strongly encourage peer review. It's OK to give a draft of your writing to your colleague, a trusted colleague. They read it. They give you feedback. We used to do this, actually, uh, in class, just bring manuscripts that are uh, without names or numbers, and we exchange, and we have time to write comments. But in a larger forum, it's not possible to do that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just very briefly, some of these rules of uh, rhetoric, uh, they date back uh, many, many thousands of years. And some we still use today because they're very effective. Uh, Aristotle in the BC period uh, worked with Plato in his academy and was the teacher of Alexander the Great, who founded the Lyceum. And one of the things he taught us is that if you are writing, uh, how effective or persuasive you are depends on how well you can master your own experience in terms of character, and that you have arguments to support your point of view, and that you feel the, uh, <clears throat> between your character and the argument with a passionate uh, response. And he called this ethos, logos, and pathos. Essentially, writing from your heart, head, and soul. Most of us uh, in universities tend to write from our heads. Uh, you know, we ask, "Where? Show me the data." But if you work on, in a public health agency like the AIDS Services Foundation, uh, you have to think about uh, the way in which to use data when you confront people every day who have uh, needs and responsibilities and are either marginalized in different forms or uncertain about the future, uh, you need to bring in the ethos and the pathos uh, in working with them. And that's really important. Um, one of the things that uh, <coughs> Aristotle taught us also that you could have a five-point plan uh, in writing your reviews, beginning with an introduction, uh, post the question, solve the question, and why should somebody care about the answer you've given, and then what needs to be done, recommendations, and, and so on and so forth. So I like this five-point plan because we still follow it today. If you pick any of the journal articles that you've read, um, within the, f the framework of public health that you did for your outline, you would see that we always still have the, uh, the abstract, the introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion, and conclusion. And that's essentially traced back to this period more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, some articles may abridge this in a four-point plan. Um, you describe the situation essentially the uh, introduction, and then what's the complication? Why is the problem still there? And then uh, what can be done to solve that problem? And then you try and provide an answer. These are excellent uh, strategies for writing uh, review articles. Uh, even more brief, uh, Plato thought that you know if you are dealing with an intelligent audience, you could uh, be more you know, pointed in your discussion. And we use this three-point plan mostly in writing proposals. Okay, here's something I'd like to do. And that's the last assignment for the course. So I have, have you have this in mind as we proceed. Essentially, the hypothesis is a falsifiable statement that can be verified by observation. Okay, if I provide this service, to the people of Orange County, we'll see a decline in the incidence of HIV, for example. So you describe that service. But also acknowledge the alternatives. Why hasn't anyone done that service before? What could go wrong? And then you bring it together a synthesis 
uh, of the resolution of the hypothesis and the antithesis. But uh, this is um, a three-point plan that works where you're really talking to people who have a lot of background on the topic, uh, but not very suitable for like a scholarly review. Okay, so um, those are the, the strategies that we will be exploring as we proceed with the next assignment. I will talk to you more about uh, those assignments after the presentation, but I thought that uh, in the interest of time, we should not uh, uh, delay our speaker, who's been very busy. I asked her to meet me in my office. We could walk or stroll over. She said, no, 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 I have to meet somebody else. And there's another intern that I'm, uh, but um, <clears throat> she doesn't like to speak uh, with the PowerPoint uh, presentation, so I'm going to turn that off. Uh, she goes by Missy. Uh, formal name is Melissa Board. Uh, she's a passionate uh, feminist who has turned her education in social work into a career uh, advocating for children, women, and their families. Uh, she's a fierce believer in preparing women for leadership roles in politics and has a wealth of experience working with policymakers, community leaders, and other stakeholders to improve access to reproductive health care for women, men, and teens. Every time I hear that somebody is not going to use PowerPoint, I know that they're, they have skills to deal with politicians, and that's <laughs> always very good. Uh, in 2006, uh, Melissa became the Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Utah where she quickly took a struggling political organization from mediocre to powerhouse in just a few years. She has written and passed into law six pieces of legislation that aim to help disadvantaged homeless youth to find shelter and women and their families to obtain unfettered access to reproductive health care. She's a spirited public speaker. She derives great joy from speaking to groups of all sizes about social justice, advocacy, reproductive health, women's empowerment, and fundraising. She's presented workshops at many conferences throughout the country, such as Planned Parenthood, Troubled Youth Conference, and Child Welfare League of America National Conference in DC, uh, in addition to the US Department of Health Human Services quite accomplished, and it's really a privilege to have her here and to have you mentoring some of our students. So please join me to welcome uh, Melissa Bird. Hi. Um, my name is Missy Bird, and I also used to be a university professor, which was not listed in that bio, so you're in trouble. Um, uh, just kidding. Um, I um, am thrilled to be here, um, just not just because some of my students are here, but also to talk to you about um, Aid Services Foundation. Um, and Del did a really lovely job going through my bio um, a little bit, but I wanted to add some to that. The first thing I want to add is I failed my students for not knowing the difference between there, there, and there. So when you're writing your papers, I highly recommend that just because I'm picky about that. Because if you can't figure out there, there, and there, why are you writing a college level paper? It's supposed to be funny, guys. Come on. Wake up. Wake up. Everybody said to me, every one of my interns came into my office today and they were like, if we're all asleep, it's because it's after lunch and it's a writing class. So. Um, my name is Missy Bird. I am the Volunteer Services Manager for Aid Services Foundation of Orange County. Um, we currently have um, a group of seven interns, two from Fullerton and the rest from UCI, and you guys have to stand up. So stand up, because you're the most amazing interns ever in the whole world. Yay! These are our fabulous interns. So I actually am going to put them on a spot for a second. They didn't know I was going to do this. You can sit down. It's OK. Sit back down. But I want each of you to say one of the most amazing things about Aid Services Foundation that you have discovered. So Serge, I'm going to start. I'm going to put you on the spot, yo. OK, so say what you like about Aid Services Foundation. Yeah, go for it, dude. I just think it's the fact that you're working with people that are like in a really horrible spot in their life, but yet despite that, everyone's so cheerful. And uh, it's really cool just to see like the impact of like, being able to give back to the community like that. And also at the same time, it's uh, it's cool because you get to see the impact of public health education because you get to learn a lot. You see like you know what 
you should be telling people what people actually don't know. And it's nice to actually see your knowledge be so. That's a good answer. One, one thing, That's a good answer, buddy. Who wants to? So, how you want to go? Sure. Okay. Um, I think the most amazing thing I, I experienced there is that uh, everyone is really nice. You know, usually most organizations, even nonprofits like this, you meet one or two people who are, you know, dicks to you, but this place is, you know, they're actually really nice there. <laughs> I, I haven't met a single a mean person. Well, <laughs> oh, that was really amazing. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Natalie? Yeah. I was going to just add, oh my God, you could not work with the most nice group of people. Even, I met Phil. Yeah. Phil's our CEO. Yeah. Oh my God, he is so nice. Like He's he, been there for 20 years. He took the time. I'm just a lowly intern. He took the time and he gave <clears> himself, made me feel welcome. And also just the array of, the wide range of services that this foundation offers to people living with HIV and their families. I mean, you want to know it. It's from you know, the case management, social work, <laughs> to food, like food assistance, to housing, to even like low cut, like low price haircuts. I mean, just free haircuts, free not haircuts. low price, free. Free haircuts, I should say, once a month. <laughs> <laughs> free, free, free confidential testing, which I encourage you all to know your status. That, that a girl. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, if you want to make a difference, and you know, ASF is a good place to like, you know, um, um, share your time and your skills, expertise. Yay, thanks guys, you're the best. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit how I got to this place because you heard a little bit about my professional career. Um, when Dell asked me for a bio, I thought, oh, here we go. So, um, so the way I got to Aid Services Foundation is kind of interesting. So I was like living the fancy lobbyist life as the lobbyist for Planned Parenthood of Utah and, and yes, I was a lobbyist, I wasn't an activist, I was a lobbyist, and I'm very proud to say that I was. When I was getting my master's degree in social work in 2003, um, I wrote, I did research on homeless youth, specifically looking at how many homeless youth in Utah identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, because I was trying to prove that we were no different in Utah than anywhere else in the country. I grew up in Utah. Um, and so, and I knew that we had an issue with homeless youth. I also knew, because I had worked in child welfare before I got my master's degree, that you couldn't shelter a youth under the age of 18 without parental consent or emancipation for longer than eight hours. Okay, now I don't know if y'all know about Utah, but we are a ski place. It's cold there, okay? So imagine there's no homeless youth shelter, none, okay? And you've got approximately 2,500 homeless youth sleeping outside in sub-zero temperatures. So I knew we didn't have an emancipation law to emancipate youth from their parents, so I wrote one on my dining room table. Chain smoking cigarettes, listening to Ani DeFranco. It was amazing. Um, and what happened from that is I called a woman that I had known from the child welfare world who I knew was an elected official in the Utah, um, the Utah legislature, and I said, Roz, would you please sponsor this piece of legislation? And she said, well, yeah, we've got to get it drafted. And I said, no, I already wrote the bill. I just need you to sponsor the bill. And she's like, you, no, you didn't, no. And I was like, yeah, I'll email it to you right now. You can have it. So anyway, I sent her my bill. And we got it um, through the Utah legislature two years later. So the first year it died, the very last minute. And the next year, um, it, it, I got it passed. And I taught myself how to lobby, I taught myself how to advocate, and I taught myself how to network with people. And I think one of the things that's really important to remember as public health students is it's not just about you know, ep epidemiology. Public health is not just about those things. There's a macro level approach to public health that is super, super important, and it's where you can make the biggest difference. And we're talking about homeless youth here, but those youth are at risk for an awful lot of diseases, including HIV especially when they are homeless. And so I got that law passed and then I rewrote our shelter law to pass change shelter law so we could shelter youth for longer than eight hours and um, got that passed a couple years after that. But in the meantime, the CEO of Planned Parenthood of Utah heard about me and called me randomly one day and um, said to me, we really um, would be foolish not to hire you to be our Vice President of Public Affairs. And I was totally blown away and stunned beyond all belief and said, uh, yeah, dream job, okay. Um, so I get paid to cause trouble and talk about sex at the Utah State Legislature, woohoo! <laughs> so I was like, okay, yeah, of course. But 
so the, the thing I want to say is every job I've ever had is because I volunteered there first. The exception was Planned Parenthood, but I think because I built my reputation in the community, that's why Carrie knew who I was. So I'm going to give you a little piece of advice here. Volunteer. Find your passion, find what lights you up, no matter what it is, and volunteer for that agency. Because every job I've ever had is because I volunteered at that place. So that's real, and it builds your resume, and it makes you look good, and it helps you figure out what you really want to do in the world. Because quite frankly, I got a master's degree thinking I was going to be a play therapist. And guess what? I love kids and all, but I am the world's worst mental health practitioner. I hate being a counselor more than anything else on the planet. And I figured that out early, thank goodness. But it's really, really important to know what you like and know what you want to do, right? And you're not going to be stuck in one thing, especially in public health. The beauty of getting a public health degree is that you have so many options when you're done, which is why I got my master's degree in social work, because you have so, you always have a job when you got an MSW. Like, you can go anywhere. You can do drugs, you can do kids, you can do marriage and families. So, you know, keep that in mind. Don't limit yourself to one thing. So I worked for Planned Parenthood, and I wrote um, four more laws for Planned Parenthood, got them all passed. Um, my favorite bill that I ever wrote, this is my third lesson, know your audience, so, um, and know how to message to them. So I wrote, it's called the Fertility Protection Act. And chlamydia and gonorrhea were rising at four times the national average in Utah at the time, okay? But nobody in Utah has sex. But for some weird reason, chlamydia and gonorrhea are going through the roof, right? Nobody has sex in Utah until they're married. So I, I went to the LDS church lobbyist, because of course the Mormon church has a lobbyist, and I went to Bill. And I said, you got a problem. We are not going to have forever families in heaven if we have chlamydia and gonorrhea causing infertility. And Bill was like, whoa. <laughs> and I really literally said it just like that. And he was like, wait a minute. And I, I said, Bill, look, here's the numbers. We've got chlamydia and gonorrhea rising at four times the national average, and it's not getting treated, which means you're going to have infertile people, which means they will not be able to have forever families, which is the purpose of you being in heaven. And he went, well, we have to do something about it. What are we going to do? I said, well, I proposed $350,000 line itemed in the state budget for STD testing and treatment. And Bill goes, that's a great idea. And I was like, good, you're going to help me with that, because otherwise it's not getting through. <laughs> and he said, OK. I ended up getting line item STD funding in the Utah state budget in, when they were cutting everything else in the Department of Health and Human Services. So know your audience. Because guess what? There's no reason Utah ever should have line itemed STD funding in the Utah state budget. But they did, because they recognized it was a public health issue and it was going to lead to infertility. It stayed in for a couple years. It's gone now. But it stayed in for a couple years, which was really amazing. We also did a bill to improve pregnancy outcomes for women who use drugs and alcohol. Um, because in Utah, a pregnant woman, I think in California it's the same, but a pregnant woman could be fast-tracked into treatment, drug and alcohol treatment, ahead of everybody else if she wanted to get into treatment if she was pregnant. But pregnant women didn't know that. And so we did a campaign with the Department of Health to educate OBGYNs, the public health department, and um, people who were buying liquor in liquor stores. We, we did um, Spanish and English flyers that were in the liquor store about getting help <coughs> if you were pregnant, which was, see in Utah the state owns all the liquor stores, so it's not like it is here, so it was really easy to funnel that money through. Um, but what that did was it ended up getting several women who were pregnant and had not been identified before then into treatment which was really an incredible accomplishment. And to admit that people drink and do drugs in Utah was also kind of a feat, right? So they're having sex, they're drinking, and they're using drugs. It just completely blew the mind off the legislature. Um, we also did a bill where um, we mandated that emergency contraception be um, given to rape victims when they presented at an emergency room. It's called EC in the ER. In most places in the country, it's a very controversial bill. But again, this goes to knowing your audience. And um, the LDS church had an exception, has an exception for abortion, for rape, incest, health, and life of the mother, which is not typical in most religions. And so I used that to my advantage and said, look, if we can provide women with emergency contraception, it will prevent an unintended pregnancy from happening. It will prevent them from having to make that decision. 
And it was the first time in the country's history that they had passed. We passed EC in the ER first year um, unanimously with a signature for the governor within two weeks, which had never happened in the country. So it's stuff like that that lights me on fire. And it's stuff like teaching. I taught at the University of Utah for three and a half years. And I taught marriage and divorce, which was super incredible because I got to talk about polygamy. And I brought in panels of polygamists. <laughs> and like, my classroom was like, it was like the home ec of the University of Utah, right? It was like, if we didn't go to BYU and get married, we have to go to the U and go to major in human development. And I'd bring in the polygamists, and they'd be like, ah! Be like, no, they're amazing. But it spoke to privacy issues. Um, when polygamy works well, when you have enough money to be a polygamist, it's actually a really incredible form of marriage if you have the money to sustain that family. And I did a lot of research on polygamy when I was in Utah and lived on a polygamous compound um, across the freeway from Colorado City and Hilldale. So fabulous women, lawyers, doctors, you know, nurses, like teachers, like the most incredible people. I've, I've, I'm still very close to most of them. So, you know, blowing the stereotypes out of the water for what this means. So then this leads me to Orange County, California, right? So I'm rocking the world and then all of a sudden I go through this really nasty time in my life where I got divorced and I was like, what am I doing in Utah still? Huh, well, I'm gonna move to LA and I moved to LA and I worked at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center for about a hot minute and or six weeks, six months. And um, it wasn't a really good fit. I was doing volunteer, um, developing training programs for LGBTQ kids in foster care, but the agency wasn't a good fit for me. So I left. And then I didn't know what I was gonna do. And then I get this random phone call from a reverend who asked me to be the executive director of a domestic violence shelter in Compton. Okay, white girl from Utah in Compton, that lasted eight weeks, until, <laughs> until he was like, and you're out of here. And I was like, yep, I'm making too many changes. I'm gonna go now. This isn't working at all for me. Yeah, the, our checks bounced, it was really awful. But um, <clears throat> it was a, a really, the women I worked with were like the most incredible. My staff was like off the hook. Miss Anita like totally, she introduced me to chicken and waffles, which made me really happy. <laughs> but it, it was just so amazing. But you know, these women are working in like the worst possible situation with the worst possible management, just trying to save these women, right? Who were coming to us at all hours of the night. The emergencies were just insane. And you know, what that taught me was that there's still more work to do, especially in marginalized populations, and I didn't even know the half of it because white girl from Park City, hello. So then I ended up moving to Anaheim um, with my partner and his three children. And so I'm lobbyist fancy face over here who becomes a full-time stay-at-home mom to three kids under the age of 10, which I always wanted a family, but that kind of, that was a lot. And, and, and I needed to get out of the house because I was, freaking out because I love children, but again, don't want to be with them 24 hours a day. So I started volunteering at the Aid Services Foundation. And I started out as their receptionist answering phones. And I was there once a week on Mondays and sometimes I'd fill in. And um, this is what it gave me. Right when I was leaving the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, the young man who I had nannied for, um, who was a very wealthy young man, um, committed suicide. He was 24, he was HIV positive by the time he was 19, and um, a meth addict by the time he was 20. So my little Andrew, my little prince, who I loved more than anything on this earth, who was my first kid, because I got to raise him for a couple years, was gone. And what I got to do at Aid Services Foundation was interact with clients again and interact with people again, because while I'm a really crappy therapist, I really miss being with people. And Andrew, when Andrew committed suicide in 2011, it, it just devastated me. And it has devastated his family. He was an only child. Um, and it reminded me that we are not done with this disease. And here's what super, you know, I love that Natalie said, know your status. I remember my first HIV test. I was 19, I'm 30, I'll be 39 this year, it was 20 years ago. I was 19, I found out that, that the guy I was dating had a history of being an IV drug user and I had no idea. So I freak out and go get my HIV test, right? Two and a half weeks, people. Two and a half weeks. You had to wait. 
Now you can get it in 40 minutes, which is awesome, right? So for those two and a half weeks, it was the longest two and a half weeks of my life. I mean, I'm sitting there waiting to find out if some guy that I've been dating for a couple months had given me HIV, right? It is so important to know your status, not just for HIV, but for all of the STDs, because they can lead to infertility. And HIV, what Andrew also taught me by dying so young, is that there is this mentality that you can live with it. And I heard one of our drivers speak in, one of our, in our staff meeting yesterday. And one of our clients said to him, you know how when you don't feel good, you just don't feel good? You know that feeling, right? Like, work with me here, people. You know that feeling when you're getting the flu and you're kind of sick and you just feel like crap and you want to curl up? One of our clients looked at our drivers and said, I feel like that every single day. And I felt like that for 22 years. You don't want to feel like that every day for 22 years. You just don't. But HIV is on the rise. 23% of high school students who are engaging in sexual activity get tested for HIV. That means more than 75% of high school students are not getting tested for HIV. And guess who's getting HIV? All y'all. People who are 25 and younger are getting HIV. And that's a, that's a serious problem. And it's not just the gays that are getting HIV. It's straight people that are getting HIV. And that's why it's continuing to happen. And I remember the very first man I knew who died of HIV. I was 11. They didn't know what it was. And my mother didn't know how to tell us that cute gay Richard, you know, who had a special friend. She, I remember my mother told us that he stepped, he used to be a runner in Laguna Beach and he would run on the beach. And she told us that he stepped on a piece of tar, because at the time it was when the tar was washing up on the beach a lot, that he'd stepped on a piece of tar and gotten an infection, and that's how he died. Because my mom had no idea how to tell us, right? They didn't even know, you know, what it was back then. And here we are, you know, 30 years later, the AIDS Services Foundation has been around for 30 years. They remember when the first antiretroviral came out and they had a staff meeting. Phil, our CEO, has been with the agency for 20 years, started out as a volunteer, ironically enough. And um, they had a conversation and said, well, we're going to be shutting our doors in the next couple years because they've come out with the drugs that are going to prevent HIV, that are going to cure this disease. And that was 25 years ago. And they're still here having this, you know, that was 20 years ago. They're still here having the same conversation. So. I think it's really, really behooves certainly those of us that are in our 30s and almost 40, but also you guys who are in your 20s to stop the spread of this disease because it can be prevented. They've now prevented it through blood transfusion, right, because they figured out hemophiliacs were getting it, so they stopped it, right? It's a really bad ban on gays not being able to donate blood, which needs to go away. But the point is they stopped the transmission of HIV flu through blood transfusion. The next step is to stop it through sex. And the only way that's going to happen is to use a condom and use lube. This is my favorite thing. I just had a conversation with the sheriff about this, blew him out of the water. Because he came in to get some housing guides, and he was making fun that we had condoms and lube at the front desk. And I was like, don't forget the lube. And he's all, ah! And I was like, no, it's really important because the lube makes it so that you don't tear, so that you don't spread HIV. Lube's like crucial to stopping the spread of HIV because it prevents tearing. Little tiny little mini tears. And that's the kind of stuff that is super important to tell your friends. Even if you're not having sex, if you know somebody is having sex, you've got to tell them to wear a condom. And if they go, oh, condoms are gross and they don't feel good and blah, 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 then at least make sure that the person you're having sex with or the people you're having sex with know their status. Because until you know your status, you can't keep yourself or other people safe. So talk to your friends about it. It's not that big of a deal. We do, we do testing in bars all the time. We do testing on campuses all the time. It's the one thing that can be stopped from spreading, and it should not be on the rise. The other thing that comes along with HIV being on the rise is hepatitis C is now on the rise, and there's an actual epidemic in Orange County of hep C being on the rise. Syphilis is making a comeback. Syphilis was all but eradicated, all but gone. Syphilis is making a comeback because of that risky sexual behavior. And it's happening in people who are under the age of 25. It's not happening in people that are older. 
And I think the thing is, is you think you can live with it, right? There's drugs. Guess how much those, anyone want to guess how much the drugs cost? One regimen of drugs every month. You can't answer this question because you know. It, guess. Someone scream it out. Anyone? Huh? $80. $80? No, no. Keep, come on. Give me some idea. What do you think it costs to take the prescription drug once a, you know, once a day, four times a day, every day for 30 days? 80 bucks is a good guess. $250. $250? Anyone, want, anyone else? Four grand. <coughs> yeah. So here's what's happening. You're spending four grand a month on drugs to keep yourself alive for an illness that you could totally have prevented from happening. You feel like crap every day, but now that HIV has been in your body for more than a couple of years and you don't die anymore, it's starting to eat away your brain. It's starting to cause really super bizarre cancers that they cannot treat because the chemo breaks your body down so badly that it makes you sick. Right? You can't be around anybody who's got the flu. And you're living in poverty because your dementia has set in. And you can't work as an IT program. One of our amazing volunteers used to be one of the head IT guys for like HP. But he can't work anymore because his brain doesn't work like it used to. And that's what you see with a lot of our clients. You can tell they're slow, right? You can tell like they're moving slower and they can't, their, their cognitive ability is going. And it's because HIV is eating away at their brain. So that, that was a big soapbox for Missy Byrne. The other thing is that um, we've got a lot of really incredible programs. And I brought some brochures, and I brought some stuff. And anything that doesn't get taken, I'm going to leave it here. You all are responsible for taking back to the office. But um, so one of the things that, you know, because, you know, we got to raise money, right? So one of the things that's coming up is AIDS Walk, which is on May 4th. And um, it's at Disneyland. And you can become a part of Team ASF. And here's the thing. You can volunteer to be a part of Team ASF. It's a fundraiser, so you do have to try and raise 50 bucks. But I find that asking 10 friends for 5 bucks is easier than handing over 50 bucks. And mind you, I don't make a lot of money doing what I do. So, and I'm raising three kids with you know, my man. So you know, it's not like I'm like flush with cash, right? But I find it's easier to ask 10 friends for 5 bucks than to come up with 50 bucks by myself. So if you are interested in AIDS Walk, it's a week and a half away. And we really need people to walk with us. Um, the other thing we have coming up that is really incredible that AIDS Services Foundation does is we have a kids program and a families program. So kids who are either HIV positive or who, um, who are living with someone with HIV come once a week to our kids programs where they can have group and they get to socialize and they get to be with other kids who have HIV or are affected by HIV. And the beauty is we have summer camp that's coming up that we need volunteers for. And summer camp is three days and it's in August and it's super incredible. And you go up in the mountains and it's where kids and their families can have three days where they can just play and go to camp. So if you want to volunteer, that information is up here too. I brought our homepage. This is our newsletter that goes out to all of our clients who receive mail. Um, uh, so this goes out once a month at the end of the month and it's got a calendar of all of the stuff that we do. It's got some articles in here. So it's really, really informative. And then we also have a new program that we just started um, called Healthy Relationships. And it's a five sessions and every month we start a new round. It's for um, men who have sex with men. And um, it helps people develop the skills to make decisions about disclosure. So one of the other things that we find, and it's in Spanish and in English, and one of the other things that's really, really super important is that people, once they're diagnosed, they don't know how to talk about it. It's like coming out all over again, right? And so it's really, really, we found really, really crucial for people to be able to talk about their status in an open way. And so that's what that aims to do. And we're hoping that the grant, the grant is specifically for men who have sex with men, but we're hoping, hoping that it opens up so that we can do it with heterosexual folks too, not just men who have sex with men. Um, and my cards are up here. And that's all I think that I had. Is this mine? Yes. Oh, that's delicious. Um, so I kind of wanted to leave it open for you all to ask questions um, if you wanted to. Yeah, you're over here like typing away and you're nodding your head and you're like, holy crap, this is crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, because I'm a 
this is really interesting because I actually grew up in Utah and Oh bless your heart, where'd you go to high school? <laughs> right in high Oh, I went to Park City. Yeah, yeah. so you guys are definitely one of our rivals. Uh huh. But um yeah, I, I moved here when I was a freshman to come here and I guess like growing up in that environment it's completely opposite than here and like I don't think everyone like everyone has their stereotypes of what Utah is and like more yeah. people and all that stuff. Yeah. And everyone assumes that every single person in Utah is more than uh -huh. But I guess my question for you is that when I went to high school, we didn't even have like any health education because it was so conservative and like taboo. And I remember in like health class, like even like, or even in any class, like talking about anything sexual related mm -hmm. was like really put down. Like, has that changed, do you think? Or like, how do you? Well, I introduced a comprehensive sex ed law in Utah the year before I left, and it died. But we got it, we got it through committee and onto the floor, which was a huge battle in and of itself. So no, there is no comprehensive sex ed in Utah. Yeah. Um, it varies from state to state. So here's the thing that's really, I mean, you bring up a really, really valid point, especially if you're involved in public health. If you don't have good comprehensive education, like it's as simple as washing your hands, right? How do you prevent the spread of flu? You wash your hands. It's everywhere, right? It's all over the place, especially when H1N1 was a big deal, like, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Why aren't we saying, put, a con put on a condom, put on a condom, put on, it's the same thing. It can make you sick. But the, the fear is, and the fear is even in Orange County, like this is why I kind of like it here, because it's sort of like the red bubble in the blue state, right? Like that's why I really love Orange County, because it's like weird. But you know, it varies from district, school district to school district and state to state and region to region. And the thing is, until we get uniform about having the conversation and stop being afraid that if you talk about sex, it means people are going to have sex, I mean, it's not going to change. And that's the issue. The problem is, is we are so weird here in this country. It, we think that modeling policy after other countries doesn't make any sense. But when you look at other countries who are predominantly white European countries, their rates of teen pregnancy are incredibly low. Their rates of STD transmission are incredibly low. Everything is different. And so until we wake up, and I think it, it, it's dependent on you all, uh, not even me in my 30s, my people in my 30s, right? Like it's dependent on the two generations coming up to make those changes, because you all are gonna be the elected officials. You all are going to be the ones who are running for office and making a difference and advocating and lobbying and doing whatever it is you're going to do. You are going to be the ones who are having the conversations with your children. Like this is the beauty about raising children is you get to raise them like, you know, my kids don't care about stuff. Like they don't have that taboo body image stuff. They don't have that stuff. And until we start raising our kids to not have that stuff, it's not going to change. I give it 10 more years and everything's going to be different. Even in the Republican Party, because what we're finding in research is that the, the up-and-coming young 20-somethings in the Republican Party are more libertarian than they are conservative. So they want stay out of my business, you know, stay out of my bedroom, stay out of my gun, stay out of my business, and lower taxes, right? They don't care about gay marriage. That's not going to be an issue. They don't care about any of this stuff. It's going to change completely. I give it 10 years and it's going to flip. So. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it varies. Yeah. And until we figure out how to make stuff uniform, and we actually figure out how to listen to the public health department, like until you figure out how to listen to the people who are dealing with this, it's not going to make a difference. And too, like, sorry. Um, You're okay. Um, um, you said that you had to work with um, a lobbyist for the Mormon Church. Mm -hmm. I guess, like, for me, I like we're always taught like separation between church and state, mm -hmm. and I feel like. Like it's very kind of like turned a blind eye of how involved the like Mormon Church is involved with politics. I think and like. But I think you find that with the Catholic Church, too. And the Catholic Church has lots of really amazing lobbyists. And actually, the oldest lobbyists, get this, the oldest lobbyists in the whole entire nation are the Quakers. The Quakers started lobbying before anybody else did because they lobbied about environmental issues which is really, really fascinating. That they are, the, in their religion, they're the oldest lobbyist group in the country, which is super fascinating. Religions have always lobbied on stuff. That was going on, if, how many of you saw Lincoln? How many of you saw Lincoln? You have to see that movie. 
it is so awesome because the lobbyists are hysterical and they're going out and getting everybody drunk and then telling them to vote for emancipation, right? Like it's so, it's, it's, it's just an amazing portrayal of lobbying. It's, it totally cracked me up. But that movie's phenomenal when it comes to talking about policy shifts and policy change and what happened. Because it may be a movie, like a fictional movie, but a lot of what happens in that movie is very true to what happens in the back door, you know, in the, you know, in the back rooms. So it's not just about the LDS church. It's about all religions have a certain arm. And here's the thing. The separation of church and state was so that the Puritans could come here and practice their religion the way they wanted to. That's all it was. It wasn't about government staying away from the church. It was so that there was freedom to practice any religion that they wanted to. And we, we talked about cross-cutting themes in public health. Yes. I'm sure it's the same in social work. Mm -hmm. You actually use these cultural differences, religious, as a way to get into well, and it's how you build a coalition. You can't, yeah. that's how you build a coalition of people to make change, right? You include everybody in the community. And it, that's what works really, really well. You take public health and the issue that you're concerned about, and then you take the agencies that are on the front line, and then you take the doctors and the experts, and then you take the elected officials and the community members who tend to be religious leaders. You gotta bring them into the fold to have the conversation. And it's not, making public health policy change and making change like for HIV and AIDS is not about coming at people where you want them to be. The most fundamental, crucial thing I've learned that I was trained as a social worker is that you come at people where they are. So you figure out where people are, and that's where you can make the change. And that's where you can make the difference in stuff. And HIV is not going away anytime soon unless we really, really pay attention, which scares me. It's shocking to me that this disease is still here. It shocks me because it's 100% preventable. 100% preventable. It's not like cancer. It doesn't just creep up one day. It's not like diabetes. It's 100% absolutely preventable. Anyone else? You had a question? Oh, I just wanted to like add something to what you were saying, what she asked, that right now, um, just recently, a senator from one of the senators from New Jersey, he sponsored a bill, it's called the Real Education for a Healthy Youth Act, and basically it promotes um, evidence-based sex education instead of like right now we just have, well, here's these diseases, and 100% of the like, effective way to not get these diseases is you have abstinence only, and then you have abstinence plus, mm -hmm. and then you have comprehensive. He's talking about comprehensive sex yeah, education. Yeah, well, that's just a federal thing. Right. Being for, right. So that's going around Congress. So, interested in that, you can always you know, write to your, write to your um, representative, write to your senator. See. Yeah. yeah. And if you want help figuring out how to find those people, go to the Orange County. What is it? What website did you have to get on? The legislative website to find your elected officials? Uh, California Assembly. California Assembly has. Um, a link that you can look up all of your elected officials on. You can also go to your county clerk where you register to vote and find that information out. You can call them. That's what I did when I moved to Anaheim is I just called the city, the city recorder, and I said I, need, I just registered to vote. I just moved here who are all my elected officials, city level, all the way up to the president. And she told me. It's that easy. That's how you find out who your people are. How many of you are registered to vote? Oh, that's good. If you're not registered, vote, registered, vote. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious. Do you know approximately how many people don't know the correlation between like condom use and AIDS, HIV? Um, because I mean, I feel like growing up, I've always heard that like obviously the way to prevent HIV is condom use. But just curious, how many people don't know that? A majority of people don't think about that when they are in the moment. Right? They don't think about that when they're getting high. Right? So because HIV is still spread by HIV drug or by IV drug use, right? So it's not that people don't know. It's what are you doing with that information? Although I will say that in areas where comprehensive sex education does not exist, that are abstinence only, or where that education is not happening, they don't know. And there is a lot of really crazy beliefs about how what sex is, you know, how, how stuff is transmitted. There was this big thing in Utah when we were talking about sex ed 
where they engaged in, it was called floating. And basically, and we found out this was happening like repeatedly, like this is high school for you, right? Like the boy convinces the girl that if he puts his penis in her vagina but doesn't move, they're not having sex. It's called floating or soaking. This is actually happening, <laughs> right? Like this is happening in schools, not just in Utah. Like I found out from other Planned Parenthoods that it was happening all over the place. <laughs> So if you don't know that the condom prevents the spread of HIV and you don't really actually think you're engaging in sexual intercourse, that's a huge problem, right? I think here in California it's a little different, but I don't think it's much different. I think there's still a huge stigma around sexual activity, especially in people under the age of 25 that aren't married. So it's not that people may or may not know that a condom prevents the spread of HIV. It's what are you doing in the heat of the moment? Are you really going to say, no, we are not going there unless you wrap it up? Right? Yeah, people always think it won't happen to them. That's right. And that's the other thing. I'm not going to get it. It's for other people. Really? No, that's not true. I have a question. So yes. obviously, um, maintaining all of the activities and uh, be there for anyone who comes in, it's expensive. And so yes. you, you raise funds mm -hmm. through the AIDS walk and the bicycle for AIDS, mm -hmm. but you must also write proposals to mm -hmm. I don't know, federal government. Mm -hmm. and who, who supports this? Walk? So um, uh, AIDS Services Foundation is founded by the Ryan White Funds mm -hmm. um, through the CDC. Um, we are founded through private donations and we're funded through grants. The interesting thing about what's happening with healthcare reform is that everything's going to shift. And the, the fight right now is to keep Ryan White funding at the same level and not decrease it because of what's happening with the Affordable Care Act. So because if the funding goes down in Ryan White, it goes down for everybody who's providing these frontline services, right? And so um, that, there's a lot of people who are working on that right now in Congress. AIDS, um, a lot of the AIDS folks up in San Francisco and Los Angeles are really intimately involved in that. We're part of an alliance, um, the HIV and AIDS Alliance here in California, representing the AIDS Services Foundation. And uh, it's called OC Hat, which is the Orange County um, HIV task force that does the public affairs work for all of the agencies in Orange County. Um, so that's where all of our funding comes from. And yes, it is very expensive. And our donations are down. Um, we're about halfway where we were last year for AIDS Walk, um, which is, you know, a, a huge bummer, right? You know, if, if everyone in, you, in, in this room figured out how to get us 50 bucks, we'd have a, you know, we'd be well on our way to getting a couple more thousand dollars happening. So, I mean, I think it's really important to understand, like, we serve over 600 people a year in the food bank either through food delivery to people who are homebound or through walk-ins or people who are homeless or people who can no longer afford to eat healthy food. And the thing is, if people can't have access to healthy food, they die. It's not just that they are hungry. It's that the HIV starts to attack their body. So that's why the food pantry is so crucially important and what we do there is so crucially important. And so all of these things that we do, the case management, housing services, transportation, food pantry, um, mental health services, kids camp, you know, it's done on a shoestring budget with 50 people, which is why our volunteers are so amazing. Our volunteers provided us with the equivalent of $600,000 in manpower last year, which is really, really cool. And our volunteers are so well valued. I've been volunteering for nonprofits since I was 18. But the value that ASF places on our interns and on our volunteers is something like I've never seen before. It's huge. It's amazing. So thank you for bringing up the budget stuff. Any other? They'll be writing proposals. Oh, good. Well, uh, thank you so much. Sure. This is a little Oh, I love presents. Uh, Yay. <laughs> and kisses, too. Yeah, Aw, thank thanks, Dad. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, one of the things I'd like to do with each of these presentations is to uh, use it as an opportunity to review some of the public health uh, cross-cutting themes that we uh, discussed. 
uh, and the core subjects. So in the topic of, of HIV and AIDS and the AIDS Services Foundation, um, in her presentation specifically, what do you recall was reference to the five core subjects of public health? So anybody pick one of the five core subjects and how it relates to this particular disease and function and her role. Do you remember the five core subjects of public health? <coughs> All right. Come on. Okay, you start. Okay, yeah. Uh, biostatistics, you need the numbers, the data, in order to prove the point when you have something. Right. Biostat she said biostatistics, you need the numbers <coughs> to show. But there is a particular word that she used where you would want statistical evidence. Okay? She said something about certain diseases on the rise, right? HIV among a certain population, right? The under 25, but not in the elderly. Um, she mentioned the increase in another disease. Syphilis was thought to be gone. Now it's coming back. Um, uh, hepatitis C. So th those are epidemiological facts uh, that are supported by statistical analysis, right? So we've covered two. I think I'll grant that epidemiology and statistics kind of go together. But you need those numbers to make a case for why this foundation exists. Um, if it's declining and we're going to eradicate the disease, ultimately the AIDS Services Foundation will go out of business. But that's not so. And you need to monitor and collect the data to make sure that that's justified to keep the foundation going and to have the resources to support its mission. What else? Yeah. Health policy and administration. Health policy. Need to for it. Absolutely. She began her whole presentation <coughs> talking about relationships with the policymakers and sponsoring bills for the legislature and lobbying. Very, very important. What else? Yeah. Uh, health education. Health education. It's not a core subject, but she did talk a lot about it. I will grant you that as a health communication under the cross-cutting themes, right? OK. The most important, I think, with HIV is the social and behavioral sciences. Social and behavioral sciences. We're a condom, you guys. <laughs> Behavior modification, yeah. And using the data to actually change behavior. It's very important. Health behavior change theory is one of the most important in this. Is there one we haven't talked about? One of you asked me this question by email. What's the relationship between environmental health and HIV AIDS? Environmental health is a core subject, right? What could possibly be the link? Yeah. Uh, I, I read about one study where uh, certain communities are, are negatively impacted economically because mm -hmm. of HIV. So a lot of people turn to, um, uh, there, there was one place in Africa where people turned to um, wood cutting again. Right. They, they were you know, chopping down trees for firewood and home use instead of, uh, because they weren't able to work anymore. Right. Okay. Environmental sustainability, the link is not as clear in the United States because there's a lot of support services that the Aid Services Foundation provides. But if you live in a country where you're the breadwinner for the family and you get HIV or the, one of the parents dies, um, the environmental support system that used to keep that family going will suddenly disappear. And people would no longer be able to go too far from the home to get their resources, the food, all of those things are absolutely linked. You have a well, yeah. Environmental health like link here in the United States is um, a lot of these like underground tattoo parlors, mm -hmm. piercing shops are opening up, and they don't really do a good job sterilizing their needles. And absolutely. Because of the regulation, I mean, you know, nobody's looking to like, use needles, so that you're seeing, young, especially young kids, because young people, young kids are the ones who are going to these places and they're getting diseases like HIV or hep and hepatitis. C. Right. This is uh, extremely controversial, but extremely important um, 
for, for the United States. In British Columbia, Vancouver City, they decided to actually build a place downtown for uh, injection drug users to go in that facility, no questions asked. They have clean needles, and they shoot up their drugs, and they leave. The reason they did that was that for many years, the city downtown area was contact. All of the streets were littered with used needles and condoms, and it was an environmental pollution problem. And it created hazard for young children. And so they decided that the best public health strategy is to build a place, a safe place for this activity to occur. And that will lead to a cleaner uh, downtown area for not just for tourists, but for the residents of the city. Um, there are many, many different ways you could think about uh, environmental pollution. But this worked. And a lot of countries were looking at that experiment in Canada. Uh, it hasn't been adopted in the US, partly because of the cross-cutting issues of so, you know, cult cultural and uh, normative issues is that, well, the same thing with the sex uh, education, that if you talk about it or if you build it, um, are there going to be more people using drugs? And we, we just have a little bit of a hang up uh, in the US in solving that kind of question. All right, what about the cross-cutting theme? She did talk a lot about uh, religion and culture and its effect on the policy. She talked a lot about communication. Um, she is a leader, right? We talked about leadership skills, and she's demonstrated many of those skills in her ability to uh, run these kinds of program. Um, what else? Systems, right? Systems thinking. She talked about how all of these issues relate to the epidemic and the trajectory, whether it's declining or increasing. These are important um, concepts to keep in mind. Okay. Any questions? OK, so uh, she couldn't stay, but I wanted to hear what you all said um, in your writing about her um, Credentials. She did talk a lot about her background, but let's very quickly go over uh, Soham. What did you think about her biography and when you interviewed her with the questions? So she had a, a really interesting background. Um, her long history as a social worker and lobbyist really helped her. Um, it translated well into her skills moving from one conservative place in Utah to a conservative place in California right. and it worked out well for her. Um, she, you know, her, her main goals were in increasing awareness about HIV and AIDS and then also um, improving access to, to resources for patients with HIV and AIDS. So, you know, not only awareness but, but help for those who are affected by the disease. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, si Young, what did she say was the biggest challenge? Yeah. Um, she said um, because UCI is such a big community, they have actually the organization has to approach two different people, I mean, two people with the different backgrounds. So, like, with the different methods, with the different culture, like, approach methods she used. So, that was kind of the biggest challenge for her. And how is she? Did she talk about how she hopes to solve that challenge? Yeah, I mean, like now she's trying to translate like programs in Spanish because Spanish is like one right. of the most used language in uh, at UCI, and uh, she like does like the surveys and stuff. So like, what other employees think about like programs they have and like, right. So we ended up working in um, advertising is the biggest thing. Right, communication. And cultural sensitivity, yeah. yeah. It's very important. <clears throat> All right, let's hear from others who have uh, done their interviews. Joanna? She's not here today. OK, we'll mark that down. Christel? Yeah. struggle 
will she find it? And to balance the administrative and the nursing aspects of the So she's a, she's a trained nurse, but works now as an administrator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The director of the I see, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so she takes care of the whole um, department, like the Right. It's just different that yeah. It's a very common challenge for hospitals mm -hmm. that they run well versus the appropriate care. I mean, they are not exclusive, but they often pose challenges. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, what about the op-eds? We covered some last week, um, <clears throat> but these are all submitted now. Last week, most of you was still in the process of deciding or writing. Um, so, Suraj, not here, yeah. <laughs> what did you write your op-ed on, on, on the aid services? Um, I am still writing it. You're still writing it? <laughs> OK. Um, Natalie. between the ages of 13 and 24. And it's roughly about 1,000 cases a month, new cases a month, are people that age. Gee, Orange County? No. Or, or no, nationally? Orange, yeah, yeah, nationally. And in Orange County, I, I'm saying, well, well, there are many reasons for this like rise in young people. Me, because I am part of this generation, I see it as a lack of comprehensive sex mm -hmm. education in, in public schools. So I talk about this bill that's going around Congress right now that will um, fund evidence-based aid appropriate, because I right. think that's important, and um, um, uh, comprehensive sex education. OK. So yeah, you mentioned that bill in, in your addendum to her response. Because only 50% of the districts, school districts in Orange County, um, had in the curriculum on sex education. They talk includes um, about includes, um, a, a module on preventing STIs and pregnancy because mm -hmm. most of them don't really they talk about not having sex but they don't talk they don't give options for people who are sexually active you know what is an STD where they can get treated or where they can get tested that's not really covered in the curriculum. So. Is it a California bill or a national bill? It's national. National. Bill. And um, what newspaper are you thinking of submitting this? Because I want to bring attention to this two young people my age. OK. Good luck with its acceptance. All right. <clears throat> now, um, scholarly reviews are going to be due next, but you've already worked on the outline. So let's hear what you're uh, thinking of with this. You should have a working title and have selected some of the articles for uh, discussion. Uh, Shirley, Hands for Africa, is she here? Okay, Shelly's not here today. Natasha? All right. I'm oh, sorry. What was your question? <laughs> okay, so what did you write your outline on? <laughs> you're, you're at the health, yeah, you're the health, not op Yeah, the outline. The outline? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what I'm reading for is quality here, Becca, right? I have op ed on my mind. All right, why don't we do Lydia first and then, okay. yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. um, so one of the articles I'm looking at uh, is a meta-analysis of fruit and vegetables. OK. So did you already find articles in the different branches of public health? Yeah, but now I'm trying to find more so with diet. Right. Originally, it was just all, only on like cardiovascular disease and risk factors. So now I'm trying to focus my search more on, um, on, on diet. On the, on the food part, OK, the contribution. I think salt will be one of the controversial ones with a lot of research, but uncertainty in how to interpret. All right, so now that you're here. Yeah, so I was speaking to the directing attorney of the health consumer portion of the Legal Aid Society, and she states that a lot of the funding that they're receiving from uh, like health 
management company because of the Affordable Care Act to promote outreach to mm -hmm. inform uh, the community about the changes that healthcare is making is so much, but so little people call in to actually ask about healthcare. So I realize that that's an actual issue in the community. So what my article will be about is how important it is to is outreach, especially in Orange County. And I've actually found an article that relates to um, the same kind of outreach done in San Diego and how important it is and how useful it is, um, how outreach is. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's a good segue into what I'm about to say. Um, these are scholarly reviews. So you, you will find articles that are research-based, perhaps, in Orange County and San Diego, but not a lot. Okay. So you'd have to cast your net a little bit broader on the topics. You know, what kind of research has been done on how to do outreach? So very broadly, that will give you more access to original research. Okay. Anyone has questions about their scholarly review in progress? Okay, so the next assignment is the abstract. It's about 300 words. Again, turn it in into the Dropbox. We'll talk about it again next week uh, before uh, the, the actual due day, which will be the following day. But if you have questions, you can either email me or Shar um, uh, about, about this. But it should be very straightforward from the outline that you have written. OK? Wait. Yeah. Where? You should have submitted your outline for oh, the. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. I know. Lots of assignments. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. What's Question. That? No, so what we just did, where three people talked about what they're writing, their scholarly review. It's like a mini event. A mini, yeah. So you, you would have read a lot. You would now just, here's the abstract. It's like a summary of my paper. OK? Is, is that all that's due next week? That's due May, May 2nd. Yeah, yeah, that's all that's due. Yeah. No, it's not an abstract of a single paper. Okay, it's like a summary of your scholarly review. Okay, an abstract is the same as a summary. By now, so you've written an outline, you found papers. Now you have a title. Now you want to tell us in 300 words. Here is the case for my article. Okay, yeah. So the article review that's 1,500. Yeah, the final version. Yeah. That's through May second, too, right? No. A draft. Yeah, that was. Yeah, it says it in my facilities. That was two assignments to on May second. All right. I'll send you an email about the abstract and the the draft is due, not the final version. Yeah. Yeah. One one more. Yeah. You, you you logged in? Yeah, I tried enrolling in the class with the um, username, or with the ID and the password that you gave us, and it's not working. So okay. it's a master one. You have to log in to the actual So the class like site. OK. Um, all right, I, I think the. The password is different for the master and the and the um, section. Mm -hmm. So I'll send you the password for the section. Okay. okay. So just to get it straight, only because I guess like whatever you're telling us that these papers consist of isn't really like in line with these TAs. Mm -hmm. So the article review draft, you're doing it on one peer-reviewed article, right? Because that's what they were saying, that you were only going to write your article review draft on one of the peer-reviewed articles you picked. Do you understand? Last week, we talked about the how to review a critical review of an article. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I used my article as an example, critical thinking. Okay. Um, now, you've written an outline where you found three different papers on different, on different aspects of your topic. Okay. To me, that's sufficient that you've read the literature, but you'd have to find more. Okay. Um, it, and I'll clarify this with, with Shah, but it doesn't make sense to now just review one article when you already have more. So I'll clarify that with him. Yeah, the, the scholarly review is a review of that topic, bringing in all of the articles that you've read. Okay? okay? okay. That's what a scholarly review is. Mm -hmm. I know it takes a while to, to get it, but you can actually find a scholarly review on all of these topics. Okay, so there is, for example, the American Review of Public Health, which is a journal that only publishes review articles. And you, if you look at such review articles, they have lots of references because they have read all of these references and then here is the state of knowledge on this topic. So what, you're, what the assignment is is that you have a grasp of the state of knowledge of your topic by reviewing a lot of articles in the literature, not, a, not just one. I'll, I'll talk with Shai about it. I'll clarify that. Confusing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you say topic, do you mean like the one of the five main topics? Or like no, so what was your topic for the op ed article that you submitted? Oh, you have to write one of the things that happened? What was your topic when you submitted the op ed article? Oh. Well, what is your topic? Okay. That's a topic that you can build on for a scholarly review. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me clarify the the assignments for the course. You begin by writing for the public, and then you write for scholars, and then you write a proposal. Okay. Writing for scholars means you have mastered the Here's a topic that's of interest in this disease that my public health agency is working on. Okay. One is salient, which means it's popular in the press, and we address that through the op-ed. Okay. Now, you have to think about what are the challenges for understanding or moving that field forward okay, from a research or academic point of view. That's what the word scholarly means. So people have done a lot of work on this. And you have to think, OK, what else remains to be done? You just mentioned to me that you're interested in outreach. And that's why I said you have to go beyond just San Diego and Orin County to look at the literature on how social and behavioral sciences health policy has contributed to outreach how uh, epidemiological issues may have a role to play in it, right? So you've selected articles based on what the researchers have done on that topic. The assignment is to summarize the body of knowledge on that topic. But you have to come up with a topic. Scholarly review, okay? And when you do a scholarly review, you identify gaps in knowledge, okay? Why haven't we solved this problem? That leads to the next assignment, which is the proposal. What are you going to do about it? So all the assignments are related in that sense. All right? So you expect a couple of emails from me, clarifications about uh, the assignment. And I'll talk with the TAs about um, what the article review is. But other than that, we'll see you next week.